All right, then let's start. Um, I, yeah, I, I present myself. So uh, my name is Stephanie. I'm an economist. I'm teaching at the FOM University in Munich. And um, I am very much into Austrian economics and into Bitcoin, of course. Before I started teaching at universities, I was actually two years a so-called token engineer, where I was um, investigating blockchain projects and building crypto economies, and um, thereby learning a lot about incentive mechanisms, which really shaped my way of seeing certain things, and um, for example, also the, the monetary system. Um, and then I more and more realized that Bitcoin is just the coin to go to. And if you really um, change the monetary system and make it better, it's like a domino effect. It just brings so many other aspects, uh, it corrects so many other aspects. And today we're talking not so much about Bitcoin, but more about how this monetary system is actually working. And um, I called this presentation today on the crossroads between serfdom and freedom. And what I realized in my investigation is that the fiat system, which the way we have it right now, is going, is actually, it brings us into serfdom and um, it enslaves, it's financial enslavement essentially because some people can create money out of nothing and the exact details how this works, this is what we will discuss today. And I then realized that Bitcoin is a um, freedom technology and if you understand why fiat is a means of enslavement, you can easily come to the conclusion why Bitcoin can then be a freedom technology. So yeah, I would say I start here right away. Now you should see it the full screen. If something is not working, then you have to like tell me because I'm not seeing anything except for the screen. And let's go. That's fine. It's fine. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. So this is what we're talking about today. So first I would like to talk, yeah, what is coming ne next? Is it like inflation, hyperinflation, deflation or stagflation? There's like uh, many of these um, definitions are thrown around and um, some people don't actually know what it means and uh, yeah, where we're going next. And then um, I want to show you why this is so. So we're really going into the theory on money creation and then you can understand why we could go more to inflation. And uh, so I took some already in advance, but this is uh, where we're going to. And um, yeah, first we're like going back in time, checking out how it was in the gold standard, because when you understand this system, it's so much easier to understand how the money creation in the fiat system works or what went wrong essentially. And then, um, so this is actually, um, I wrote a long article on this um, in, in spring. And then a bit later in the year, I wrote a longer article on how money creation out of thin air enables financial enslavement. And um, if you want to know the details, you can also have a reference on that um, and also more sources. And then in the end, um, I want to invite you all to discuss how do I pre best prepare for the fall of the fiat system? And um, yeah, the, the, there are like more diverse things and um, we can go more in depth on this in the discussion. So first, what is inflation? So there are essentially two different definitions on inflation. inflation. Many people are just thinking about inflation, okay, the prices increase. This means that each monetary unit is less worth. Then there's another def definition, which means that inflation is an increase in money supply that is not captured by increased productivity. And when you have this, an increase in money supply that is not captured by increased productivity, you in a sense have an increase in prices. Um, this was actually the definition of the Federal Reserve in 1919. This is, this is how they defined inflation. And now inflation has more become yet yeah, an increase in prices. So um, first one has the result and the other one says the mechanics why 
where inflation actually comes from. And in turn, you can realize that when we have an increase in productivity and a constant money supply, this leads to deflation. And this also means that everyone participates in a growing economy because the monetary unit is just more worth and I can buy more of the goods. Jeff Booth is also writing, uh, wrote a very interesting uh, book on the deflationary technology Bitcoin. So, is it maybe hyperinflation that we're going into or is it just inflation? So what we're seeing here now, it's the money supply, the, the blue line, and it increased like inc incredibly, especially like in 2020, it's not just linearly, but it's like exponentially. So we have an increase, um, incredible increase in money supply, um, money printer go poor. <laughs> we all know that. Um, so this is what happened, especially in this year, and it certainly has its consequences. And on the other side, here, here you see the red line, which is the velocity. And you see that the velocity of the money went down. And for consumer goods, they, they usually have a higher velocity. This means when the velocity of this money goes down, this is an indication that this newly created money is first placed into assets. So uh, what I see, or what is generally rather typically in these inflationary scenarios, is that first the asset prices goes up, and then at one time it trickles down to the economy and to the consumer goods. But first it's about the asset prices, real estate, gold, this goes up. Um, and this is also called the Cantillon effect. Um, this is also very, very good to, to have a look at. Um, to understand more the dynamics of what really happens when more money is created and how does it affect the whole economy. So some were talking, well, maybe we have a stagflation. And what is a stagflation? Essentially, it means um, we have kind of this inflationary scenario with a stagnation of the economy. So um, this kind of goes into this economic crash scenario or at least economic downturn. And we certainly have a great economic crisis and an increase in un unemployment. So here you see the, um, the unemployment quota went um, up tremendously in 2020. Here you see it on the, on the left side. And the GDP went down tremendously, which you see on the right side. It's both for the United States. So we certainly see right now that we already have uh, an economic crisis. Um, which is actually bigger than we had ever before um, since the since the world wars, and um, there are like some people who say, yeah, it will go better from now on, and some say it gets gets even worse. I belong rather to the second group because many insolvencies are just pushed further into the future because you don't have to say um, that you're insolvent. The, the laws were changed. So um, I think we will have this big wave on, of insolvency that will come in the next month. And here you also have to understand we had companies that were not working so well before the crisis, so before 2020, and now we have good companies that are affected by this crisis because, you know, they needed to lock down or shut down the operations or they're like dependent on supply chains which are not working so well anymore. Um, so, so there is a lot of uh, insolvencies uh, going to happen in my view, and some already happened. And some say, yeah, maybe we have a deflation. And so in one case, I did experience it directly, <laughs> that prices went down. So I um, had to buy the same mattress again, and I realized, wow, the price went uh, down like more than 25%. And I asked myself, well, why is this so? And I was thinking maybe some of them are having or facing less demand and this is why the prices go down and they nevertheless have to just sell it off because they have their warehouse full or they have to somehow keep on with the operations. This is why some producers go down with the prices in order to get rid of them. But um, this would only fit into the definition of inflation or deflation in a way that the prices change. Um, but what is certainly clear, I go back to the definition, is that we have an increase in money supply, 
we saw it in this year, it went actually um, very sharply up. And it is not captured by increased productivity because we have the opposite going, going on. So um, we actually have uh, a decrease in the economic um, productivity. And this um, actually puts more gasoline into the fire. So it makes this uh, creation of money even more worse. So um, this is an introduction where we are right now. And um, now I'm asking, uh, now we go to the question, how could the money supply in the fiat system increase so much? What is behind? What are the mechanics? And before we answer this question, we are going back in time to the gold standard to understand how the gold standard worked and how the fiat system evolved from that gold standard. So here um, you have a, a figure that shows the lending during the gold standard and this is without fraud. So this is how it should be with an honest gold standard. And um, I know we have many technical people on the call and those that have a little bit of an economics or a business background know that here, this is a balance sheet on the left side and you have two sides on a balance sheet. And on the one side, you are showing up all the assets that you have in a company. Like for example, if you make a balance sheet of everything that you own, then on the balance sheet, there would be your what you have in the bank account, what you have as cash at home, what you have as um, at close, whatever, everything that you own is on the asset side. And um, <laughs> well, maybe one thing, the cash that you have at the bank account is actually, you can only have a claim on it. It doesn't really belong to you, but you have a claim on the bank. Um, we can also discuss this later if you're more interested in that. But uh, let's have a look at the other side. It's the liability side. So uh, maybe I got some credit from a bank or from a friend um, to invest in a startup, let's say. And then I'm just noting down all the liabilities I have that are some, at one point I have to pay back with uh, my operations, with the business that I have. So, um, and when, and during the gold standard, you had these custody providers who actually were having the gold on behalf of the people and um, registering it. Just a warehouse for gold, essentially. And on the asset side, they had the gold. And the, on the liability side, there were the warehouse receipts. So um, with this warehouse receipt, you could go to the um, custodian and say, okay, I want to have my gold back, and then you can get it back. And the custody provider does so because he gets some money for that or he charges money for that um, because he has some extra security there to make sure that the gold is not stolen. This is why you're going there and put it there. Um, and then at one point, this custody provider started to also become a bank. So they're not only storing gold on behalf of the people, but they're also investing. So they're also becoming an investment vehicle and they are actually giving out some of the gold that people have stored in there and giving out loans to others and then make some return on this. Um, how does this should like in a, in a honest environment, it should be the case that everyone knows exactly what is invested into which company. So that these two parts of custody and investment vehicle are really separated. We all know this is not the case with banks. Um, we do not know who they give out credits. And so we actually don't really know what they're doing with our money. But um, yeah, this is, this is how it should be, a separation between custody and investment vehicle, or um, at least that the ones who put money in there or gold should know where it's going to. So, and here we see that um, some of this gold is just redistributed to the creditor, um, to the debtor, so the one who was borrowing this gold from the bank. So uh, instead of the gold on the asset side, of course, the gold is not there anymore because it was given out to the one who claimed this loan. Then they instead have this claim on the debtor 
and place then this new loan in there. And this is also an asset because they have a claim on it and they get some interest for that. So this is what an investment vehicle does. So now I already prepared you. This is how it's working without fraud. And now we're having a look how it's working with fraud. So with fraud, they're just um, putting a new loan on the asset side and they're giving this uh, debtor some unbacked receipts. So they're just giving a warehouse receipt of some ounces of gold. Um, and then the P those or, or the debtor can use these warehouse receipts to buy um, some products he needs for his business. But if everyone would go to this custody provider and claim their gold, the ones who do so last would not get their gold back because some of the receipts are unbacked. So this is fraud. Um, they're just making imaginary warehouse receipts where actually nothing is behind. Um, it's just simply unbacked. I hope this is clear. If not, we can also discuss this more later in the discussion. But now when we have a look, how is it working with the fiat system? You see that just when you see it at, at the colors and not at the, all, not, not at the um, text, you see it's the same structure. So um, I will guide you through this. What, what, is, what, what do you see here? So here you have a balance sheet of the central bank, like for example, the ECB or the Federal Reserve. And on the asset side, the central bank has claims on loans. They could also have some gold in there, um, but mostly it's claims on loans, which is also an asset. They have a claim on someone. And on the liability side, there is a deposit. There are deposits by banks and by the governments. And the deposit a bank has at the central bank is a liability from the central bank perspective because they have to um, give them the money when they ask for it. And now when we see when there's a new loan, then it's just, an, they say it, it's an accounting trick where they just place this new loan on the asset side, a new claim on the loan, a new asset, and they placed new debt a new, a new deposit to the debtor, so the one who was um, asking for this loan. So um, important is, of course, that the one who gets the loan from the bank has an account at the bank. And the bank just creates this number, plugs it in, and to, puts the other number on the asset side. So it's not backed at all. It's just created out of nothing. And this is the accounting trick that they're using. And I actually have this information from several sources, let's say that from the beginning, so there's also like empirical sources, but the best resource is the Bank of England Quarterly Bulletin 2014 that are really well discussing how this works. There's also one in German um, from the Bundesbank, it's the Wochenschau. Um, if you find, in, in my article, you find the link, then you can uh, then you can have a look on your own what they're saying, but this is exactly what they're saying. So what we can see here, the sum of this new loan is simply added to both sides. So money is not transferred, but instead created out of thin air. So when we had here, the money was transferred, the gold was transferred to the debtor, but here it's created out of thin air or this accounting trick. So, um, and we always have to keep in mind that when new money is created, this leads to debasements. So every monetary unit is less worth, and this is, some call it stealing from the people that hold this money, or, or stealing from the people in general. Um, yeah, because um, every unit of money is just less worth, and those who get this newly created money first are benefiting the most from it. This is the Cantillon effect again, or Cantillon effect. So, and this is not only the case with central banks, but also with banks. Um, I go through this again because um, that you really got this, how this works, the money creation in the fiat system. So here we again have the balance sheet of the bank with the assets, which are claims on loans. There could be more than just that, but for simplification, I just inserted the claims on loans there. 
And then on the liability side, you have the deposits by the people. So you have your bank account at the bank and um, you have a claim on the bank and the bank in turn has a liability to you. So you don't really own it, but it's just a claim. And yeah, when we have this new loan, it's simply added to both sides of the balance sheet. It's exactly the same process as for the central bank. So money is created out of thin air and money is not transferred, but uh, simply created out of thin air and added to both sides. And here I would like to let Rothbard speak, um, who he said that the uh, that it is very difficult to see the economic or moral difference between the issuance of pseudo receipts and the appropriation of someone else's property, which means taking away the property of someone else, or outright embezzlement or more directly counterfeiting. Most present legal systems do not outlaw this practice. In fact, it is considered basic banking procedure. So when you follow me on Twitter, I'm um, often saying that actually this whole monetary system is kind of the biggest Ponzi scheme in human history. And it's also the biggest criminal system in human history because um, money or property is simply uh, taken away, dispossessed through this um, monetary system and hardly anyone uh, looks through it. But more and more people are realizing this now, fortunately. So um, now we're going a little bit more into depth how it works with the creation of that. So when we have a reduced refinancing rate, what is a refinancing rate? So when a bank um, wants to get some money at the central bank, they have to pay the central bank for that. Like before negative interest, it was like that. And um, they need the central bank money. So banks need the central bank money in order to do the operations. It's a bit uh, complicated, actually, because you have two layers of money. So first you have the commercial bank money, and then you have the central bank money. And they're interacting in a way that when I am sending money to Michael and he has a different bank account, then the bank that where I have my money has to send central bank money to the bank of Michael. So they need central bank money in order for um, allowing these transactions to work. And this has quite some major implications. So when we have a reduced refinancing rate for banks at central banks, they can afford to borrow more central bank money to process these transactions, just as I said. And so banks can expand their business by giving out more debt, because what is the business model of a bank? A bank makes money through the interest rate. It's not through the debt they create, because when the debt is repaid, it's just the money is destroyed. But where they really make the money is through the interest rate. So banks have an interest to give out as much debt as possible and actually preferably to high interest rates. But, you know, they're like in competition with each other. And when a central bank reduced their refinancing rate, then there's more pressure on the banks to reduce the rate at which they give out more debt. And this is the next level here. Banks reduce the interest on debt to attract debtors because this is how they make money. And then there's more demand for that because it's just cheap. And then also the commercial banks just create more debt. And here I can very much recommend an article by Ben Kaufman, Bitcoin and the Business Cycle, where he explains very well that when you have a very low interest rate, then this creates boom and bust cycles because you are putting this money into some companies that are actually not sustainable, but because you have this cheap money, you can just do so, or you can again and again just push, uh, put more liquidity in by getting this cheap money from the banks. But if they were to increase the interest rate to normal levels, then the company would go bust. And there are actually normal interest rates by the market if you wouldn't have like central bank manipulation. And these low interest rates are essentially central bank manipulation. So they're just setting the interest rate. 
And this is also, this is where you can understand how these zombie companies come from. So they come from these really reduced artificial interest rates, which create uh, these boom cycles that eventually need to go bust. So when you get a credit from a bank, then the bank can say, okay, you have to pay it back as, uh, as, the, as we agreed it, as to the terms that we agreed it. And if you cannot pay it back and you bought a house with it, then the bank can seize the house as a security for the credit. So you really have to think how this works. So the bank creates money out of thin air and then he, the bank has a claim on the one on the people who they give this um, debt to, and they can even dispossess the house, you know. And they created it out of nothing in the first place. So something's wrong, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, but it goes even further. I have to say, um, I was quite surprised at this, but um, this is what I found really in the article from the Bank of England, but also in the uh, Bundesbank. I think they're also explaining this, um, how another way how money is created. It's namely also created in the process of buying assets, which is quantitative easing. So, or in quantitative easing, they're doing this like really to an extreme that it's just buying up things on the market. And maybe someone was wondering, how can they buy up so, so many stocks, so many bonds, so many treasuries? And the answer is quite simple. They're creating this money out of thin air. And they're doing it exactly the same way as they did it with the, with the debt. So here we have, again, the balance sheet of the central bank. Um, you know already the asset side and the liability side. Here I used assets such as government bonds um, as an example, because this is how, what we're like talking about. Before that, we had like some claims that could be in there. And a government bond is essentially a claim on the government. And here we have the um, case where the central bank buys the government bond. And this government bond is simply added as an asset on the asset side. And the money for this government bond, because they need to pay for that, is placed in the account of the seller of the government bond. So let's say I am the city bank and I'm selling a government bond to the central bank. Then the central bank just inserts the money for the government bond in the account that the city bank has at the central bank. And here we already see the central bank has quite an extensive sense of influence on the economy because they can selectively purchase these assets. So before that, we already saw that they have an influence on the amount of money that is created through debt but they also can selectively purchase assets and thereby support certain companies or certain governments um, and influence the economy to a very great extent. Um, so we have government bonds. They also buy mortgage-backed securities. You can have a look at the central bank um, balance sheet, Federal Reserve, for example. I'm making an analysis in one of my articles. But they're also buying bonds and stocks, and we're like going into this in more depth very soon. So here I just made a very recent snapshot on the total assets of the Federal Reserve. And those of you that were following this a little bit in the last month by the money printer go per, we know it went up tremendously. So here we, it was around 4 million. <laughs> But I, I, say, I tell you what the 4 million really means. And then it went up to like 7 million. And it does not mean 4 million dollar, but it does mean 4 millions of millions of dollars. So here below, I first thought, okay, they did it wrong, but they didn't do it wrong. So here it's just the total assets and millions of dollars. And you have to make million because this is the, the unit <laughs> in which this is um, the scale is showing. And you make this million times the 7.5 million, which is 7.5 trillion. And this is the 
uh, balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. So what are they doing? They're um, buying up assets. They're calling it bailout, but um, I'm calling it um, takeover. So um, we were discussing already how the central banks are buying assets um, in the process of money creation or how they use the money creation process for doing so. And this is exactly the same how banks are doing that. So not only the central banks are buying up uh, the market, but also banks. And yeah, it's just exactly the same uh, principle, uh, the bank that buys the stocks, that a stock is just added on the asset side and the deposit is uh, placed on their seller's account of the stock. So let's say I'm selling um, some stocks to my bank. Then the bank um, adds these stocks to their um, assets and they place the money for that in my bank account. And I created it out of nothing in this kind of um, accounting trick. And now this is really fascinating. So um, we all know that the um, stock market went down tremendously right after the lockdown. And at one point, it just recovered and went up. And I was really wondering, why is this so? So I was Googling a little bit and I was, you know, I know that the central bank has a very great influence. So I was checking out what did the central bank do on the 23rd of March. And they announced that they are buying the ETFs to stabilize the market. So they're actually preventing of this great boom to go bust. We were already explaining this before that we have an incredible overvaluation of assets because we just are flooded with money. And um, this boom needs to go bust eventually. And this year would have been an opportunity, but uh, the Federal Reserve stepped in to prevent the boom from going bust and creating this, blowing up this uh, bubble even more. And as you know, yeah, it stabilized and went up again. So what happened actually, investors wanted to get rid of their stocks, which they considered as malinvestments. And they could get rid of them because the central bank were buying them up at uh, overvalued prices because it would have gone down even further. And so what they're doing, they're essentially bailing out the investors. So many people confuse this like they're bailing out the company or the people working at the company. No, they're bailing out the investors. What happens if a company would go bust? I mean, it could be another company who buys this company um, up. I mean, there are like also private equity funds who do this and who reorganize the whole company and the employees are not canceled um, necessarily. But what is clearly happening is that the investors are bailed out and the boom is prolonged. So we are not going to like normal situations anymore um, where this boom eventually go, but would go bust. But no, we're continuing in this artificial central bank boom through this money flood. And yeah, this is one, one of the Twitter accounts that I'm following. I'm actually only following on Twitter, but he's having like really nice uh, tweets every now and then. And he said that the Fed will not stop printing until uh, the top 1% own ev everything. And for understanding why he said this argument is essentially that those who get this money first um, can use it to buy up things and to just accumulate more wealth. So um, let's say when I'm really rich and I have some assets, then I can get a cheap credit and then I can speculate and make more and more money and just let my capital work. And since we have this like super cheap debt, debt this is what's happening. And on the other side, banks and central banks are really like buying it up and completely owning it. This is the other side. And, you know, uh, rich people are behind the central bank. So now this was it on the part of money creation. And now we're like going a little bit more in depth how this really comes to financial enslavement. So uh, you know the saying, money rules the world. And what I was thinking while writing these articles, those who create money out of thin air rule the world. And um, I have this, uh, this 
this figure here that you see here in the background, I actually took it from the $1 note and it's also quite interesting to have a look at what does it say here. So the annuit coeptus means favors our undertakings and novus ordo cyclorum is Latin for a new order of the ages. And there are also like many interpretation what, what exactly is meant for that. So if you're interested in that, um, that's also something interesting to look into. But I was thinking, okay, what is the hierarchy of central banks, banks and governments? And I came up with that. So I'm only using these three. And I do see the central banks even as superior as the government, because the government is now depending on the central banks to finance their operations. And so they really have to be friends and... Um, yeah, so this is why I would say that the Federal Reserve or the Central Bank is even beyond above the government. But I really have to say here as well, the government would have the opportunity to make the whole federal system, federal reserve system and this whole banking system illegal. And this is what happened in the past. So um, there was there were already central banks before the Federal Reserve. And they were, it was just not extended that they could do, continue with the operations. Um, so, um, yeah, you can also like question that, but this is a little bit how I see it right now. So because they pump all the money everywhere to the government, to the banks, they have a lot of power. So what is like quite clear or like very clear for me is that the banks are just, you know, they have just become an arm of the Federal Reserve because the banks are only surviving because they get the cheap money with the Federal Reserve, otherwise they would go bust. So um, in my last lecture, I had the government and the banks on the same level. Right now, the banks are really to see them as um, the puppets of the Federal Reserve. The government has a bit more power than the banks because they could still outlaw it, but they're like very much dependent on the Federal Reserve to get finance. And this is what uh, Bitcoin defunded state is about. So if we, um, if the fiat system, if the fiat money is nothing worth anymore, the government can finance themselves with fiat money. And this is how it's working. This is how it is defunct the state, what is meant with that. So central banks exercise inf influence on the economy through dictating monetary policy. First, we had the through setting low interest rates and thereby influencing how much debt is created, but also through simply buying up assets. And this um, power is directly related to the ability to create money out of thin air. And this is something that I found in the Federal Reserve Annual Report, and it was really surprising for me because we're always told, yeah, the Federal Reserve and the government, they're like independent from each other, or the Federal Reserve must be independent of the government. And then I found this, that uh, the surplus funds of the Federal Reserve banks are transferred to the Treasury, which is a part of the government. So they're like directly working together, and you can find it directly in the annual report. Um, Michael uh, was so nice um, adding some links in the description. And yeah, it was, I found it on page 15. And actually, I, I didn't um, expect this. So I was quite surprised to, to find this when I was reading the NRA report. Um, I was Googling a little bit, and then I found this really interesting book of the joint hearings before the subcommittees of the committees on banking and currency of the Senate and of the House of Representatives. Um, charged with the investigation of rural credits, and this is from 1914. So this is something where some people were investigating um, some banking-related things, and then where they were going to the government uh, and were like speaking in front of the Senate and the House of Representatives and laying out what they found. And what I found in this um, in this book was the the, the claim of Mr. Daniel, um, who said, let us control the money of a country and we care not who makes it, its laws. So this also um, fit very well with my idea of seeing the Federal Reserve as superior to the government. 
because money rules the world and you can influence so much in the economy and the whole world by influencing the monetary system. And that is why he also says, yeah, um, money is superior to lawmaking and to government, essentially. And he's also saying some more things, like if a country and its people are mortgaged for the assessed value of their property, and the bankers control the money, the bondholders are not the people own that country. So the bankers essentially own the country. And then it makes no difference whether you call it a republic or a monarchy. The people can never be free as the borrower is the servant of the lender. And what we have clearly seen is that the fiat system is a debt system. It's built on debt. And new money is created through making debt or um, also through purchasing assets. And But the only people who are allowed to do it is the banks and central banks. Only they can create this money out of thin air. So um, there's light, there's light in the end of the tunnel. Um, we have Bitcoin as an antidote to that. So I really liked Jörg Helmstorff explanation of you can imagine Bitcoin as a supermassive monetary gravitation object. So I would say Bitcoin really takes power away of the whole banking system and also of the governments eventually because they are really much working together with the Federal Reserve with this whole banking system. That's how they get their money and their power from. So Bitcoin takes away power from these central authorities because they are defunding the state and they're defunding this whole fiat system where money is created out of nothing. Because, yeah, with Bitcoin it's created with mining as most of you technical people know. So um, we have a confrontation of different value systems. So the Federal Reserve is, or the fiat system is much about dependence because when you get some money via debt, then you're depending on the bank. You have to pay it back to the bank. And you know, right now you cannot pay, uh, buy real estate so easily because it just got so expensive through inflation. And when we know inflation measurement does not take into account uh, increases in assets prices, it's only about consumer price index. So we actually have a much bigger inflation through this money printing. And so um, we are dependent on, we need to step to like buy real estate, we cannot do it with, with sound money anymore. Um, it's also centralization. We're seeing it more now with the idea of central bank currency. I mean, that's really pushed even further. This is also why I'm seeing we're like at the crossroads now. Um, and because, you know, everyone is completely um, transparent, you know, uh, but you don't have cash money anymore with central bank digital currencies, but everything um, is tracked or monitored or could be tracked at least and funds can be frozen. So there was a recent um, example where um, a lawyer from Den Haag um, got his funds frozen because he inv was investigating um, certain, where the United States government was going into Afghanistan, I think, something like that. But yeah, they can simply just uh, freeze funds and that's not the first time it happened. And yeah, this essentially needs to leads to serfdom. And you can also have a look at the road to serfdom from Hayek. It's more about the socialist system. But um, yeah, the monetary system is also a socialist uh, monetary system because we don't have a free market of money. You cannot say, okay, um, I would like to choose Bitcoin and gold for paying everything. Or at least it's not so easy because you still have to pay taxes on it. And you need some... Um, euros for paying your taxes uh, as well and this is why uh, people say okay this is where some value comes from because you, you, you need to do it in order to not go to prison essentially well so this is the, the, the one side and it's getting even worse I would say uh, with the central bank digital currencies and on the other side, we have Bitcoin that brings self-sovereignty and decentralization and essentially freedom because it is a monetary system that is not relying on debt or nobody can create money out of nothing. Um, the mining power is uh, used very well by securing the whole system. And we have so many awesome people working there. 
and improving the protocol, improving the second layer lightning, where we can have transaction, where, where, where we can serve, where we can actually use Bitcoin as a new monetary system around the world, because we have this uh, second layer. And uh, maybe some more improvements need to be done, but at least, yeah, we're working on this. So that's, that's the light of the tunnel, I would say. And yeah, more and more people realize that there's something wrong with our monetary system. So I certainly see it as quite likely that we have a hyper-Bitcoinization um, in the future. And we see um, it might come earlier than expected. So um, I hope you understand now why I have come to the conclusion that Bitcoin is a freedom technology where fiat money is a means of control. So now I would like to go into the final part of this presentation. How do I best prepare for the fall of the fiat system? Of course, get some Bitcoin, understand the technology. And um, you all probably know a lot on that and how to work with that and how to like um, get other people to adopt this monetary system so we can opt out of the fiat system as a whole. And then we can also think, yeah, how do we want to be organized? Do we need a state or can we have a Bitcoin citadel? And this is essentially the concept of free private cities which is not a state as we know it, but it's a service provider who just has the most basic things of protecting life, liberty and property, and everything else is served by the free market. And the important thing here is that when you are entering this private city, you have a contract, a bilateral contract with a free private city, and it cannot be changed. And this is the great difference to a state. You have a majority and they can impose rules on the rest. And this, you don't have this with free private cities. So this is an opportunity to get rid of the state and nevertheless to have some protection because we do know that there are still some violent people that do not respect property. And if you are interested in that, we can discuss this in the uh, discussion. And... Um, I warmly welcome you to also check out the podcast here by Stefan de Vera with Titus Geber. It's really um, it blew my mind <laughs> when I was uh, listening to it um, in the beginning of the year. And um, I actually posted something on this uh, on Twitter and it got a really lively discussion among Bitcoiners and you can check it out as well. I really like this homepage here on Citadel 21. They're like more and more explaining this concept. And also I recently had a talk or a conversation with Tito Skebel and Jeff Booth, which uh, in K1, by bringing in the deflationary technology in Bitcoin and connecting this with the free private cities. So um, this is more on the external part. And I would like to add something which is not so much considered yet in the Bitcoin community, Namely, how am I handling something, how am I handling fear? So here when I was seeing this, okay, some guy, I'm not sure, I don't know if it's like true or not, um, but it's certainly possible that he got 1,400 Bitcoin stolen. So I guess all of his Bitcoin got stolen. And I would ask you, would it trigger some existential fear in you if this happened to you? So I was asking this question to myself and the answer was certainly yes. And however, this yes become, became more nuanced over the time because I was working since a year to not be um, like, let's say, controlled by fear, to really face this, to feel it, by feeling it, transform it. And you know, when the Bitcoin um, price went, goes down incredibly, we all know it's like fear, uncertainty and doubt. This can again trigger some fear, then you can see it and, you know, like, like get rid of it. So that you're essentially really empowered and that you're trusting yourself, that you say, okay, I will go through this, I make it, even if everything goes a little bit different than I expected. So what do I want to say with this? Um, fear is something where you can be manipulated. And for being really self-sovereign, it's uh, also important to really check your emotions and to get rid of this fear programming. 
and um, neutralize all you think because when you are programmed or when you're triggered with fear this makes your mind cloudy you cannot think so clearly and you could more easily be steered in a direction that could not be as good for you so um, this is something maybe new to you maybe not so new to you where i would like you to to think about this um, because, you know, I certainly think that we will go into quite turbulent times in the next month or in the next year uh, or something. So I belong to the people who expect that the fiat system that we have inflation, maybe even in the next year or like in spring or something, hyperinflation. It's, it's not so easy to say that, but we will have quite some turbulence. And so it's, an, it's a good idea to know how will I handle this to stay same, sane and clear in my mind and do the best of these situations. So this was it with the presentation. Of course, I always um, say that don't trust, verify. Um, I also have a list of resources here. So this is the main resources where you can like um, read some of these things up. Um, Michael was also so nice um, by really pasting in all the links in our meetup group. And yeah, I'm very much looking forward to your questions. I also put, um, have some backup slides on free market, free private cities, and um, yeah, mostly that, some other things. And yeah, I'm curious on our discussion now. Thank you. Yeah, great talk, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, do we have any questions? Is there a QR code to tip? <laughs> Thank you so much. Not yet, but um, I should do this soon. Yeah, uh, in the next, in the next ones, I'll do that. In the next yeah, yeah, yeah. article. <laughs> Uh, I, I have one question. Um, do you know the velocity of Bitcoin? Oh, that's a good question. I think I was looking it up once. Uh, it, it was a long time ago when I did this, like half a year ago. I think it was one or something. Um, yeah. It's just one. I thought it was higher. Actually. Was it higher? Could be. I, I don't know. I've never seen the, like, uh, there are so many charts floating around, but I never mm -hmm. saw this figure. I mean, you had, like, from the normal M2 in the United States was one, a uh, two, and now it's like sub one, right? Um, and I always thought due to the technology, it's m actually faster with Bitcoin, I thought. So the thing is, velocity is, so when you're holding to your Bitcoins, when you're not using them for, for payments, then the velocity is lower because the velocity says how often the, the money is yeah. exchanged in a year. So yeah. many are hold, just holding onto it. So yeah. I think the velocity will increase because it will be more and more used as a payment system. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised about one, uh, but better look it up. So it was like half a year ago. I think I remember it was low, quite low, def definitely lower than US dollar. Oh, okay, thank you. I have a question too. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that uh, central banks buy up stocks. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, I just heard uh, that uh, Sweden Central Bank announced just a few few weeks ago that they are starting to buy stocks. Oh, interesting. And I wonder, I wonder how long the Federal Reserve have been buying stocks. Yeah, so I saw this announcement on the 23rd of March 2020. So, and there was a great discussion whether um, they should do it or not, not, you know, it was critically reflected in the economics community. And many people said, yeah, I mean, they're just doing market manipulation then and they should be independent and it shouldn't be so good if they do that. So um, this is why they started the last as possible. So this is how I see it. And um, I said that buying up stocks, to be more precise, they were buying up ETFs, so bundled stocks. So they just started this year. Yeah, okay. Actually. <laughs> yeah. And how much of their assets today is ETFs? Uh, what do you mean how many stocks they bought? 
uh, yeah, no, but how 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 much of their total assets are the uh, ETFs? Okay, so I do not know how many ETFs they have in value. I just know the total uh, balance sheet, but you, I think you can look it up. Um, so I know that they have, they differentiate the total asset sheet, which is uh, 7.5 trillion right now. And then you can see uh, how much is treasury, how much is mortgage-backed securities, how much is, is bond. bond. So the great majority is treasuries. Um, but yeah, they're having more than that. And on the ECB, actually, I was um, looking like which bonds they invested in there. And I really have a table where they say in which bonds they invested in. Um, but yeah, um, I guess you find this information online. Thank you. If I may add just, just um, on this one, uh, Vlad is speaking. Actually, the whole practice started with the Swiss Central Bank as a front runner following the crisis of 2008, 2009. And nowadays they are actually uh, the single biggest shareholders of some of the greatest tech companies in the US, like, I don't know, uh, Google and, 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 and likes. I so, think they bought, they bought Apple stocks, as far as I remember. Apple as well, yeah, well, uh, several. So they, they are the, the, the very, the very first front runner of this practice, they they created Swiss francs through the mechanism as explained by by Stephanie earlier, and um, yeah, they went straight into stocks. Uh, how so would you? You can check, so you can check on, on Swiss Swiss bank um, Swiss central bank uh, reports on how much and what the portion of their assets is in, in, in the stocks, but, but I know that uh, I've read somewhere they, they do own stocks directly, so it's not true ETFs, it's not true any, any other sort of uh, derivatives. It's, it's a direct intervention, or it was at the time. So I'm not an expert on the Swedish Central Bank, to be honest. Um, I was following a little bit the Bank of Japan, and um, because, you know, um, Japan is very often those that do it first, um, also from a financial perspective and um, also from an economics perspective. So this is why it's why it was for me interesting to look at them. So I don't know um, about Sweden. Um, though. It's probably all the same in the West. Yeah, yeah. So what I saw though, because I was looking closer into the ECB as well, and the ECB did least, uh, by, bought less assets than the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve um, printed the most, bought up the most, and now the question is why can they do so? Um, and the answer is they have the United States dollar, which is like the most, the strongest currency so far. It is the currency where um, the, the international trade is done with the euro dollar, so you need these dollars for international trading. and. Um, it is also the currency where most debt is issued. And when you have debt issued in US dollar, then you have a um, uh, demand for US dollar to pay back the debt. So this is why the Federal Reserve has the easiest way of just printing, you know. But then also when the Federal Reserve starts printing, other central banks also have to start printing to devalue their currency to be in alignment with the US dollar. Otherwise, their currency would appreciate very much um, in, co in comparison to the US dollar and it, this could deteriorate and trade. By the way, if we have like one currency on the world for trading, this would benefit trade because we don't have all this exchange stuff. It would make everything go much smoother. And if we would have Bitcoin for that, it would be awesome. If we would have like one central bank digital currency for the whole world, this is kind of the nightmare because then they can print even more because they don't have competition and um, they can impose negative interest rate. <clears throat> uh, do you think you can compare the situation right now with 1929 with the Weimar Re Republic? Mm. Is it this one to one or do you think with the technology now it's accelerating even faster or how how would you compare this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah that's a good question so i i do expect that we have hyperinflation just we had it in 1929 
um, what we have to keep in mind is that we have an incredible bubble that was just inflated with the central bank printing. And this is much stronger than we had it in 1929. So, uh, and now we don't have war. So you could say on the first time, yeah, okay, maybe the companies are not hurt as, uh, that much. But when we see what happens to the companies through the lockdown measures, through the um, destruction of the supply chains, um, I mean, this is really intense. So it is warlike, the impact on the economy. And since we have this incredible bubble that was just like inc inc increased in the last uh, decades, um, like crazy, really, um, it could be even worse, to be honest. It is actually quite interesting that uh, the Eastern European countries, uh, they are quite liberal when it comes to like Bitcoin, ATMs, for example. If you go to Poland, you can go mm -hmm. to any city. There's a Bitcoin ATM in Czech Republic as well. Do you think that they might decouple from the euro? Because at one point, mm -hmm. I don't know, uh, do you know if the Polish Central Bank is printing as well to keep up with the euro? But because... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Or um, or do you think they might like decouple and then there will be a, a like overvaluation of the slotty or the Czech krona, for example? Um, I don't know how they're doing this. I mean, this is up to them if they also keep printing, but now they have the opportunity to print as well because the others are printing and mm -hmm. then the uh, government can make benefit of that. So I expect that they do that. Um, it is quite a wise idea of uh, small um, governments or small states to allow Bitcoin because when we have Bitcoin, we can rebuild this economy um, in a sound way. Mm. So um, this is why it is the most likely that these small companies do so. Um, and, you know, big companies or big, uh, big states could rather uh, make, con continue with the socialist ideas and just put pressure and they have, you know, all these economic pressure and uh, what they just created and smaller, smaller governments mm. maybe don't have this so much. So I would rather expect that smaller co countries would start first in adopting Bitcoin. And also there, the, the currency, of course, first goes bust. So the last currency to go bust is the US dollar because it's mm. most used and there's most mm. demand because of the of the of the debt demand when did you buy your first bitcoin it was in 2017 okay <laughs> at the beginning or the end at the beginning <laughs> oh, okay good choice good choice yeah <laughs> a question from my side uh, this coral speaking here so uh, you talk very positive about Bitcoin. Do you think that or why do you think that uh, governments or states would adapt Bitcoin? This is kind of an assumption I think you, you made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, okay, thank you for answering this question so I can make this more clear. So I actually see the opposite on the one side and, the, and this is what you said on the other side. So um, the, the countries that have more uh, more power, like... Um, police, like military, more suppression, where it's, they can enforce their socialism, uh, dictatorian structures easy, they can make a prohibition of Bitcoin. Because when they prohibit Bitcoin, it's much more difficult that the people use it. So then they can put their central bank digital currency in and they say, okay, you have to use it. And this is how the CBDC gets some value and how the government can still be in place. So um, it will be very interesting to see how it will pan out now in real life and how far they can go. How much are the people willing to swallow? So I would rather see this from the, the bigger, the stronger company uh, countries that are more dictatorial, that they do prohibitions. And um, some smaller companies that are more liberal, that they are rather open to Bitcoin, see the opportunity, to, okay, okay, this is now how we can be the first and also attracting these smart people and rebuild our, our country. So I see both, actually. And I, I certainly see it as possible that we have prohibition, we see. Okay, there is a, quest a question in the chat. Um, 
Do you think that the share market will go down for a long time? Because you said that the Fed bought stocks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that it will rather continue to go up because it, they can just always pump more money into the market. They can do it limitless. This is also, oh, how was it? Kazakhi? Kazakhi? Some, <laughs> he has a funny name. Um, he was saying it right in the beginning of the lockdown that they can just print limitless. So, and they can buy up limitless. Um, I rather think that we have at one point um, a deter deterioration of the fiat system. And do you think commodities will go down or up? I thought they will go down because people can't pay their loans. Also a question in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, well, it depends on the commodity. So what um, other um, economists say is that um, like monetary alternatives would rather go up and then commodities like food, they, they still have value. But um, it really depends how the market goes. So some would rather go up, some go down. Um, like luxury stuff could maybe rather go down. Food would, is always necessary. So um, this is what I would see. And on the other side, um, I mean, what we have to keep in mind with the stocks, this is a big bubble. It's actually super overvalued. And it's only so high valued because we just have this flooding of money. So um, what many economists say that at one point this also like cracks, everything is kind of cracking. And um, the best to have, you know, really think, okay, what do you need at home? Yeah, I mean, you also need food. Maybe just have some real food at home <laughs> and not just buy commodities. And yeah, some alternative currencies are um, also helpful. But yeah, of course, the prohibitions could kick in. That makes it more difficult. Yeah. So, yeah, you can go deeper into the rabbit hole. And of course, this is not investment advice. <laughs> I'm not here for the money. Yeah. <laughs> um, how is it in your academic sphere? Are you a unicorn or do you see your colleagues are like catching up with the topic? Because when inflation hits, we actually more people who can be a multiply, uh, like who multiply the knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. Because when there's panic, people... Mm -hmm don't know that they're for example bitcoin paper wallets right so it's like and um mm -hmm. do you see people waking up or are you still like do you still mm -hmm. have a bit of very little niche and it's like oh you're doing a meet up there oh this is some nerd like you know you're playing computer games more or less you know or yeah. do you see a shift there or is it yeah so i certainly see that many of the population wake up and are um like listening to alternative media platforms and also they're like saying they're realizing that this money is created out of thin air but many of them are not that deep into yet not don't understand bitcoin yet may, may, money may, may <laughs> some may think it's another scam um yeah or created by some elite people or whatever hey, it's a cia so, psyop to yeah, exactly lure us into a bargain uh, yeah uh, how is it cashless society? Yeah. yeah, so but what I certainly th see is that Thorsten Polite and Markus Krall mm. they are kind of the thought leaders here in Germany on this whole inflation thing. Markus Krall here also has always has really nice elaborations what he thinks in the future. He was very often right in the past. Mm. Um, doesn't mean he is again right, but uh, we see. And he has just a great background because he worked in the banking system. He knows how these whole risk system work. Yeah. And I, I have to say, I learned quite a lot of them. They're really, really good on what they have to mm. say. And they're also very libertarian. They're like also behind the Austrian School of Economics. Um, they are not so much into Bitcoin yet, but maybe starting a little bit more. And um, Yeah, in his book, he writes that, you know, he was very into quantum computing, right? So he's... Two years ago, he thought, okay, quantum computer will take over and then the encryption of Bitcoin won't be enough, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so I see this is definitely a threat. Um, maybe some were building on a quantum computer in secrecy. Um, then the question is for what are these used? Maybe there are other use cases for that or maybe mm. it's coming out to just deteriorate Bitcoin and then it's, yeah, so this is, this is certainly a threat to Bitcoin. Mm. So... Um, I'm, we could also maybe go a bit into this like gold versus Bitcoin. So um, 
Yeah, so this is one thing where there's an attack vector with Bitcoin. They're like, also you need um, electricity. So if you have a blackout and some of these things are not working. So it's not, Bitcoin is not like wonderful in any case. And there's like no attack vector at all. So you just need to see it objectively. But I, um, all in all, I certainly see it as superior because the great thing of Bitcoin in contrast to gold is that you don't need a custodian to send it over distance. Mm -hmm. And this is where we got this whole problem. This is, I mean, you saw it in the in the talk. We had these custody providers that held the gold and were creating unbacked warehouse receipts. And this is how this whole fraud and mm. how the whole fiat system came from. And with Bitcoin, it's different. First, you can send it over distance by yourself. And you can, when you decide to put it at a custodian, you can always check your address whether the Bitcoins are still there. Yeah. So this is just beyond... That's just extraordinary with Bitcoin. And this is why I also see it like superior all in all. But um, yeah, certainly there you can see like these and the decent that aspects and weigh it off and make your own opinion on that. Mm. Yeah, many gold and silver bucks still still stick to their products. Yeah. That's um, and you have a low liquidity as well. Yeah, you have to wait till nine o'clock in the morning on Monday yeah. to get to the store. Get the cash in Germany. They scan your ID as well, always. Actually, mm -hmm. if you want to buy and sell, you have few sellers. So it's like with Bitcoin, it could be anybody in your city. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm super excited about Bitcoin. Also, the whole privacy application from Fabi, what the people are doing, it's just, it's just beyond extraordinary. I'm super amazed. Mm. <laughs> yeah. It's like pretty bizarre that this, it's actually the ecosystem is all there, right? And people just like, rather go to the football game at the weekend instead of reading some good books, right? Yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> but this is also slowly changing, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's so many rabbit holes to go into and the financial system is just one. And um, yeah, but eventually you should also go into this one. <laughs> <laughs> a question towards uh, this girl again, towards uh, central bank money. So there's a reason why uh, central banks uh, print money. So if they're well-minded and if they do it right, they can do uh, positive things uh, to the to the business. Uh, the, taking this away, is there a disruption that you see, or do you can you imagine that things like replacing central bank money via bitcoins could go smooth? Oh, I certainly think so. Um, and this is now going more into um, Austrian economics, free market theory. Um, so you said they could do good by creating this money out of nothing. So what is actually happening? They are taking money away from the people that hold this money by creating this new money. This is essentially what it is because it's a statement. And then they are reallocating this money um, by their idea. So um, if you say they are doing something good, then you assume that they have superior knowledge than the market because they know better where to put it. And this can be challenged. And I would say that the free market um, is superior because every actor in the free market knows their preferences, knows their resources, knows what is needed, and then create um, things to serve the needs on the market. And if you have someone who assigns some money to someone, this is a planned economy. So um, if you, I can very much recommend going into the coordination problem by Hayek. He explains this very well. And um, then you can think what makes sense for you. Yeah, I'm not so convinced what you're saying because I think Hayek is is quite famous for for, uh, for his thinking, but there's problems also with that. Uh, you, your statement that uh, the free market is positive uh, is, of course, something that can be challenged as a statement. And putting something in place in, uh, to regulate this market might be also worth uh, of, of thinking about that. And the central bank, if managed well, might be helpful. Is, this, is there something wrong in this, in this logical uh, 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 um, uh, argument chain? Um, well, so when you're saying about an intervener, so the central bank intervenes mm -hmm. and changes things. 
So this means that the central bank knows something better. And on the other side, he's, the central bank is, is imposing the will on other people. So this is not freedom. So this is like the one thing. So from the moral perspective, do you, you can think, do you, do you think that's good or not? But on the other side, from an economic perspective, you need to um, assume that the central bank knows better where to put these resources. And this is very much challenged with this coordination problem because um, everyone in the market has a better idea where um, resources are used and where this money is used and not with a central planner and the central bank actually becomes a central planner. And we saw it already in real life with the UDSSR, they were having the central planning and it didn't work out well. I mean, that's going to the extreme then. And yeah, taking it the other way around, maybe the free market where everyone is free to operate as they wish and serve the market needs, knows the best where to allocate the resources. The cryptocurrency market is a complete free market, actually. And actually, for every problem you have, you have a solution, or at least two, actually, normally two companies who offer you a solution, normally three or more. And, mm -hmm. and you have no quotas, no subsidies, and it still works. We have exchanges, we have wallet providers, we have people who work for free, like here as well. They do it in your free time because you're passionate about the. So it actually can work. It's probably the good thing that Satoshi is dead, so you don't have like a guru who's like above this. Mm -hmm. So there's like a neutral way of. Um, yeah, actually, that's super interesting that you're saying this. I mean, nobody knows who's behind the Bitcoin network, and it's now super decentralized, and it's a completely new way of thinking. It's a paradigm shift. It also starts in the mind mm -hmm. on how to how to think things. Yeah. Yeah, also we have, of course, the white paper there. You can, <clears throat> there it says it already, yeah? all the trust that's required to make it work in regards to the central banks. I think that's the whole reason Bitcoin um, came to be. Um, another question was um, in the chat, still was with the com about the commodities. What do you think about real estate? Will real estate go up and down? Maybe yeah. it depends a lot on the region, right? Yeah. So I also see this as a great real estate bubble because why do the prices of real estate go up? Because my money was printed and this money was first used to buy real estate or stocks or assets. So it's an asset bubble that we have right now. So um, on the one side, it's kind of overvalued, but um, it could go continue. I mean, if they're just printing more and more money. So um, we need certainly a correction in this because this whole fiat system it's just it just went uh somewhere into some fantasy land it's not, it has nothing to do with the with the real life and also like prices of of stocks do not reflect real life anymore it's just the the pumping of money into it so um i it's certainly possible that the prices still continue to go up because we just have this wave of printing but then we can also think okay what happens if the whole system crashes what if fiat becomes worthless yeah then the alternative monies become more worth and then you maybe can buy some real estate with gold or bitcoin it depends also what are the people then if someone sells his house does he want gold or bitcoin so it really depends what the people want essentially hmm. or maybe something completely else yeah. Yeah, I guess the question did insinuate that maybe people will need money and so they would also sell the real estate probably. But yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's maybe also yeah. an interesting yeah. fact. So it will be really interesting. I said something else. So um, I mean what we are well, what will come then is central bank digital currency. And the question is how much will the central bank digital currency currency be accepted and used and this depends really on the people are they seeing that this is a scam or are they again buying into this ponzi scheme and um i heard yeah okay that uh, in the united states i want to impl implement a gold standard again and i was like laughing and i thought like no uh, are they really coming with this again i mean i could print again more this is where we came from so this doesn't solve the problem but um yeah we really see what the people are choosing whether they buy into this again and then maybe you can buy a house with central bank digital currency i don't know 
But um, it really depends on the people if they realize this. And if they realize this, they're going to a sound monetary alternative. And just the best ones we have right now are gold and Bitcoin. And I certainly will favor for Bitcoin. Um, but I'm not saying that gold is completely stupid. You can still use it as cash, you know, then you don't have this custodian problem. But still you have verification, divisibility, all these other things that you don't have with Bitcoin. So that's another rabbit hole to go to. <laughs> I have a question about uh, the fractional re reserve thing. So, mm -hmm. uh, for for example, um, uh, USD Tether, uh, there, there, the company doesn't have all their cash. They has have some commodities or so, uh, some other stuff to back uh, that, and uh, people are going crazy over that because it's not not hundred percent backed, but. If you have bank in your name, it's magically okay to have not everything or at least or have nothing and uh, give out money. So, so mm -hmm. uh, I feel it's like like uh, there's some dissonance between between it's a company and its fractional reserve, or it's a bank and its fractional reserve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think about. It? Yeah, um, so first I um, was really, I want to nail down what does fractional reserve mean. So on the one side, it can mean that uh, maybe remember the first p uh, slide on the gold standard, where some of the gold was reinvested, but every essentially everything has still is backed by something. So this is the one way how you can see it, fractional reserve, that not everything is just held in place so they can give you the money, you know, they're not having all these tons of US dollar, but they reinvested it. And the other thing is that um, some of the gold is simply unbacked with um, unbacked warehouse receipts, which is fraud or which was fraud. Um, and this is the other way on how to see fractional reserve banking. And um, when you're like going into this, um, always figure out what does the author mean? So this is the one thing. And the other thing is, okay, with what is the fiat system really backed? <laughs> and I was investigating this, um, and this is my the article on uh, a, a, a balance sheet analysis of uh, central bank balance sheet analysis, something like that it was called. And then I really went through the balance sheet, and I realized that most of the assets on the balance sheet side are treasuries. So, and the Federal Reserve notes, the the bills that you have, they are actually backed with what the Federal Reserve has on its asset side. And this is mostly treasuries. It's also some mortgage backed securities. Then you can have a look at the house market index and then you see that the prices of houses are even higher than in 2008 where we had this MBS bubble bust. So the bubble is even bigger now. And um, then you can think, okay, the treasuries, what is actually a treasury? Why does it have, a, why, what is behind that? And the treasury is actually the obligation of the United States government that they are paying this back with taxes. So essentially, the taxpayer is behind that and it's the future tax payments. So this is kind of what the system is about. And you know, they're like creating more and more treasuries and more and more enslaving actually the whole population into the future. And to be honest, I don't expect that these treasuries will ever be paid back. Yeah, me, me neither. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I was more thinking about the first uh, type of, of uh, fractional reserve. So, uh, like ban banks can give you a loan, uh, and you have to give, give um, um, have a security for that. But uh, why not some random com company can do exactly the same. So why why is there why is there a difference? So I'm I'm not sure. There's like you have a banking license, and then you have like this magical thing to print money. Mm -hmm. So um, so wait, are you with the unbacked warehouse receipts, or are you um, asking the other thing now? No, about the about the backed because. The back one, okay. And only loan you something if, if you have some sort of your security mm -hmm. or the yeah. security, yeah. Yeah, um, so I explained that um, in a sound system, you would have a differentiation between bank and custody. And um, imagine you have a bank that does both. I mean, we have this right now, so it's not so difficult to imagine that. And uh, when they 
I mean, you could also have an investment vehicle who does that or a gold custody provider who has still something that they keep, which you held, which you gave them to put into custody and the rest that they invest. But this is typically for investing. So I, I don't know where it would make sense with a corporation to do that. Um, I mean, it's, you know, you're giving them something and the one part is in custody and you can retrieve it and the other part is an investment. So it's the, the typical investment scenario. Okay, the, the company will give you like shares of the company, but not dollar bills or euro bills. Um, yeah. But you know, this is a completely different system again. So the one thing is the investment vehicle. And when you invest in a company, then you get the stocks and then you can get the dividend back. And they can use what you gave them for uh, for their operations. But usually you don't get the money directly back from them because you know you invested it once, you can just trade the stock. So it's a little bit different, but yeah, uh, also a bit similar, you know, because they're using it for their operations. And on the other side, the investment vehicle was using it for investment. Is this clearer now or did I get it right? <laughs> So, so, so the point of my question is more why the bank can make money out of thin air, but some other company or private person can't do it. Oh, okay. It well, I, I mean, that's a very good question to ask. Um, it's just because they have this banking license, license, they have this banking software. You know, it's in, embedded in the software and they have the system and they just make, okay, credit and then it's done. And I tell you something, and this was really, really something. Um, this uh, study by Richard Werner that I'm also like linking to, he was checking out with a bank to figure out whether this money is created out of thin air. And I tell you what, those that were from the board of this bank, they did not know how money is created in the bank. So it's done via the software, essentially. Some people know it. Not everyone at the banks know that. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they don't change a uh, running system, yeah. Yeah. What is your price trajectory for Bitcoin? <laughs> no, no, no. Do you believe in stock to flow? Do you believe oh, okay. rather than it's like very tied to the stock market in the US or mm -hmm. do you believe it will rise uh, linearly? Do you believe it will go up when lighting is ready and people really can spend it in the stores? Mm -hmm. So this like... Yeah. So on the one side you have um, supply and demand. And the demand, all, of course, increases if it becomes more valuable because you can use it better, yeah. you have better applications. So this definitely filters in. Um, but certainly the supply, if the supply is just uh, halving because of the halvings and the stock to flow explains it so well, this has an incredible influence. Uh, but I wouldn't say that's, that's only that. I mean, if we don't have people working on it and building lightning, um, then maybe not so much, but still a store of value. But nevertheless, you need to use it for some use case. So mm -hmm. it also has some value. So um, the demand side also filters in. But I'm more going to the to the supply aspect, that this is really the main aspect, mm -hmm. I would say. Uh, but on the other side, right now, we have this crazy situation that we will have a fiat system crash. Mm -hmm. And this makes everything completely new. So it could go up like very much because I mean, if fear does nothing worse, then everything mm. goes up. Yeah. <laughs> and then you actually need something else to measure it to. Then you need maybe gold to measure it to, or maybe real estate. I don't know. Rather gold, I'd say. So um, yeah, it will be really, really interesting where we're going to. Mm. And when we have prohibitions, this will also impact the price mm. um, in the beginning at least. Someone said, okay, when there are like more prohibitions coming, it's even like going up because the people say, okay, Bitcoin is worthy. And in Argentina, we saw it, okay, they were prohibiting buying it with a, a card, with a credit card, and then, you know, they were buying more. So um, it really depends also on the people, how they value it, how it's mm. continuing with that. And then on the other side, I mean, Maybe some people that actually are profiting from the fiat system nevertheless bought into Bitcoin and could do some market manipulation. That's also possible. Mm. So everything is possible. 
But Bitcoin is a sound money and um, the quantum quantum hack. So this is kind of an attack vector that I see. But if we don't have that, I, I would see a hyper Bitcoinization. Then it goes up. That's how I see it. When would, would you see at what Bitcoin dollar price would you see like a flippening where like people start to count in, in Satoshi like 100,000, 1 million, 10 million? Well, you know what I mean? It's like at the point where it's so valuable that it will be present all over the world. Mm -hmm. Is it already without 100,000 or a million? I don't think that it necessarily correlates so much with the price, but rather how it's used. Okay. So when you're using it for your payments, then you will count more on Bitcoin. And I mean, Venezuela is already, as far as I know, quite a lot is running on Bitcoin. And also in Lebanon, now more people are using Bitcoin. Where, where, where? Uh, Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon, no. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, where the fiat system is crashing in these small countries, we already see the tendency towards Bitcoins. So, mm -hmm. And this gives us a trajectory how, how it could happen to the bigger um, countries. Okay. I think that that will start slowly. So, for example, I'm thinking in Bitcoin when I'm making a expensive, buying something ex expensive like maybe a notebook or or a smartphone. Then I think, oh, my, how much is that in Bitcoin? And then uh, I value the Bitcoin. Which, yeah, uh, I can. Uh, uh, this is there is a like a store in Berlin. They may uh, they have a bread that is they ship bread for crypto. Yeah, you can buy. With lightning, Bitcoin. I tried that. Works. Ah, yeah. Was it okay? The hyperinflation bread. Yeah, yeah. Was good. Was good. And so, but he fixed the price of the bread in Satoshi. Uh, you can look. I uh, only yeah. tried it once. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, but it's just yeah. just when we are talking now about pricing here, this is an interesting idea that it's like he fixed the price in Satoshi, and so he's like. You, it's called hyperinflation bread, I think. Yeah, yeah. Hyperinflationsbrot, yeah. I mean, uh, maybe it's, it's definitely for you interesting. So to have like uh, the first, you know, real Bitcoin price index starting. <laughs> but you can't fix prices in either currency unless you're a socialist, right? <laughs> <laughs> Depends, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Someone was asking in the chat still, um, how long, how long do you think it will take until, until we see hyperinflation in euros? So be a good crash profit, Stephanie. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I am more following um, the. Oh, I'm more in alignment with what Marcus Karl, what he says. So, um, and he is more pessimistic, or maybe you see it as optimistic because you then have the chance for hyper Bitcoinization. Um, so he said, I think we will already have more inflation this year. I think it's actually already starting. So some prices in the supermarkets are going up already. Um, I think that we will have quite a big wave of insolvencies. Right now, this law is extended till March next year. And then it would hit us. But, you know, it really depends on when the government, like, makes it go bust, you know. And when, mm. yeah, it really depends on them. So it's not so easy to say. But I would rather say, so I'm right now counting with, like, spring next year, we'll, we'll get more into rate uh, inflation. And then maybe only a bit later hyperinflation. But it could be wrong, so... And it's changing. It's always changing. It depends on the laws um, and on the central bank policy. And much more on what the people think and how they attribute value to it. Do you think perhaps that they have more tools nowadays than back then to prevent such hyperinflation things? Well, I mean, they're doing everything to make it more inflationary. I mean, they're printing like crazy. So, the, yeah, that's, I mean, we, we made the um, definition of inflation and in former times, the definition of inflation was um, more money printed, which is not captured by the, by the economy, by the productivity. So what they could do to alleviate the effects, to open the economy completely right now, um, so that the uh, productivity increases. But, um, I mean, right now we have a lockdown in Australia, so it's rather going the opposite. So that's, as I said, it's gasoline into the fire. Yeah, but 
there's, for example, the modern monetary theory, and they say um, inflation will not hit the general people unless um, wages increase due to money printing. And so what they're saying then is either um, that these are, that wages would not be affected by monetary politics or they can separate that there would be completely independent financial um, areas that don't affect each other, which I think is unlikely. Yeah, no, I also don't see that. So um, this is the Cantillon effect, essentially. Um, so where does this money first go to? And I see that it first go to assets. And this is why um, when, I mean, they're already printed so much money and we don't see um, such an incredible increase in the prices and the consumer goods now um, because they're first going into the assets, I would say. Um, and then, you know, it's more and more trickling down to the economy and then it's also trickling down to wages. So the wages are going higher and then also the, um, the consumer goods are priced higher. Everything it goes higher because the monetary units is just less worth. Yeah, I guess that's the question if they can really, if they, they really think you can separate that, if you can really have, have, have separate econ uh, economic circles, basically. So... Uh, I wouldn't say that you can separate it. The only thing is with the quantitative easing, um, now it's getting a little bit more technical. Um, some more money, central bank money is shifted to the commercial banks and some of this money is just, just stays there. And if it doesn't go to the economy, it doesn't create an impact. And But you also have to differentiate central bank money is used for interbank transfers. It's not directly used in the economy. So um, maybe this could be a differentiation. So if you just have money printing that is like stuck at the banks, it doesn't impact the economy. So this is the argument many of the fiat system proponents say because it's stuck at the banks. But, you know, at one point it's more and more going to the economy. I mean, it's, it's pushed for a reason into the banks so that the banks can then make more credit or give out more credit and then it goes to the economy. Um, I have something to add on the inflation side. I just remembered like like a few weeks ago, the Federal Reserve said that they're not longer trying to get to 2% inflation per year. They try to middle around 2% a year and they want to compensate like the last eight years where they're not hitting 2%. So so they're shooting for like 3, 4, 5, 10%. Nobody knows, uh, but but what 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 will they will they do? It's it's crazy. They 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 didn't achieve the two percent percent, and now they're saying, "Oh, we're doing more than two percent." But it's it's so crazy. Does yeah. nobody sees that these guys just flying blind and trying out things? So I I don't know. Oh, I don't think that they're blind. I think they know exactly what they're doing. And they're just saying, oh, yeah, we have to adjust it up because they know it will go up because they just printed money. And that's what happens. We have more inflation. And they're just saying beforehand, before, you know, before the trickling down effect occurs, oh, yeah, this time we have to go it up already, assuming that it will go up because they know it, that it will go up because they, you know, they made, path, they made the way to, to make it go up. Yeah, but... I, th I think they, they're trying to get to 2%, but they they don't know exactly how much to print to go to a certain percentage. Maybe they overshoot. Or basically, they're saying, I'm we're trying to overshoot now, and maybe that will work. Mm, yeah, so I think they're certainly overshooting. But one thing, um, they cannot directly say exactly what's happening because, yeah, they don't know when it trickles down because there are like so many people involved and they also don't know how much demand there is for debt. So when they're creating more money um, or when they're giving out, actually when they're reducing the refinancing rate, then the banks can get more money and then they can give out more debt. But this only makes sense if there's demand for that. And this is what's happened. There was not enough demand for that. So nobody wanted the money, essentially, even for these cheap rates. And this is why it was kind of stuck. So, um, and this is, they don't know exactly what is the demand for that. What is what the people want? Um, how's the market working? I mean, there's a central planner. 
they do not have uh, all this information. Yeah, but they always say we have all the information and we know what we're doing and we're doing it exactly right and so on and not saying, oh, we we are not sure we will try this and maybe it works. <laughs> but in actual reality, they're doing that. They're just trying out stuff. So I have the feeling. Mm. Yeah, so I think they know exactly what they're doing, but they cannot know ex um, like the mechanics, you know, but they cannot know exactly how the market will react. So, um, yeah, I mean, if they're a central authority and if they say, yeah, we're super stupid, we don't know what we're doing, then they're not like credited and the people don't think, That's okay, they're legitimate. So, of course, they have to say that we're smart. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I, I have the feeling it's like a big experiment, more or less. Oh, yeah, it's certainly an experiment. We haven't had this before. <laughs> big experiment on Bitcoin, right? <laughs> yeah, that's also, yeah. Good. Do we have any other questions from anybody? Okay, it seems everybody, everyone is satisfied. Then thank you, Stephanie, again. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for joining and for listening and for participating. And, yeah, see you soon again. <laughs> see you. Maybe next time. Take care. Thank everybody. you for organizing. Thank you for your great talk. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for the great talk. Thank you for organizing. Cheers. Cheers.